Hello there, today I'm talking to the data journalist Walt Hickey. He's taken his mathematics degree and a passion for numbers and applied it to news reporting. More specifically, he's carved out a curious niche in the world of culture, applying statistical analysis to Raiders of the Lost Ark or asking deep algorithmic questions about Pokemon. He's got a new book out and it's called You Are What You Watch. We'll be talking about what he's done there a little bit later. But first, let's learn how Walt got started and the influential role played by a fictional mathematician from the film Jurassic Park. I have seen you referred to as Walt and Walter. Do you have a preference? Uh, no, we, we count both. Uh, yeah, I basically have gone by Walt professionally a bit. It was easier to get some, uh, some URL and usernames early on in my career, but I go by either. All right. Well, what do I call you? I'd say you're Walt on the book. Yes, we'll go with that. <laughs> Where in the world were you born? Yeah, I'm from the United States. I grew up in uh, in New York, uh, just north of the city. And uh, yeah, I had, you know, high school in New Jersey, college in Virginia. And uh, I've been in Queens ever since in New York City. So yeah. What was Walt or Walter the little boy like? Were you... Uh were you already into the numbers and the stats and the data? I had a knack for them. Uh, I definitely was good at it. I think, uh, you know, I, as I was growing up, I, I was pretty good at math, and I never really kind of saw that necessarily as a career. Uh, and then uh, I saw Jurassic Park, and I saw that there was this extremely cool representation of a very uh, interesting dynamic and, and, and kind of fun mathematician in there. And all of a sudden I was like, all right, maybe this is a job. Maybe I can do this. And obviously, I'm not, you know, touring parks these days and, you know, evaluating the viability of a dinosaur-based entertainment thing. But uh, it, it definitely got me pursued and, and interested in, in how to, you know, this could potentially be a thing that I actually do. So, so I majored in it in college and, and kind of the rest is history. Well, let's go into Jurassic Park for a minute then, because I did read this section early in your book where you talk about the influence of Jurassic Park over you. And I was incredibly influenced by Jurassic Park as well. It was a huge film for me. Yeah. Tell me specifically about how it influenced you and this character. So Jurassic Park is a movie about a group of professionals from the real world who are brought to a magical place where they have invented dinosaurs. And the point of this expedition is to get them to sign off on the park and give them basically an expert's thumbs up. Um, there you bring a paleontologist, a paleobotanist, they bring the lawyer for the park. And one of the guys that they bring is this guy, Ian Malcolm. And Ian Malcolm is a chaos theory guy. You'll have to get used to Dr. Malcolm. He suffers from a deplorable excess of personality, especially for a mathematician. Chaotician, chaotician. Functionally, what that means is that he's a mathematician who thinks about probabilities. And I think that it's heavily implied, you know, in the fullness of time that either I realize it, that they bring him on because he's very much kind Kind of like a pop science, pop math guy. It's clear that he's written a couple books that were pretty influential, does the talk show circuit, is probably a little bit more celebrity than mathematician these days, but nevertheless, is still a mathematician. And he saunters in there like a leopard and is just fantastically interesting. He asks incisive questions. He flirts with everyone, regardless of uh, if man, woman, everyone. Dinosaur, for the love of God. Uh, he is just a, a, an interesting, dynamic, steam-sealing guy who clocked immediately what the problems with this park were going to be, was Cassandra-like unher uh, unheralded, and, uh, and then eventually, you know, is one of the people who through various acts of heroism and various acts of, you know, just kind of chilling out and looking hot in the basement of a bunker, uh, it really steals the movie. I'm simply saying that life finds a way. You you have a, a notion potentially of, of, you know, math as being a thing that is, that is nerdy at times, and you have this notion of math as a thing that is done just with, with chalkboards and closed offices, and I think that having that kind of representation of a guy who, here was somebody who applied skills that he learned in math to the real world was right, and obviously, you know, was able to contribute to kind of a more dynamic experience than perhaps, uh, you know, otherwise the profession is, is notorious for. Now, now, eventually you do plan to have dinosaurs on your, on your dinosaur tour, right? He is just someone that was cool and someone that really kind of broke a lot of the stereotypes about what a, a person who has a career in math does and looks like. I think that I really liked how he explained stuff. I think that that was a really cool thing. Like, there's obviously this really 
exciting and, and very charged scene in a car where he's explaining, well, here's the idea of you know, chaos theory and probability. It involves like putting a little bit of drops of water on, on, on the back of somebody's hand and how they all go in different ways. And, you know, as a person who like, you know, sometimes got math concepts that peers didn't or, or you know, tutored people before or things like that, that is a kind of a fun experience of it where you have an opportunity to kind of convey a thing that you know uh, to folks who maybe would like to know more about it and, and being able to convey that in, in, in lay terms or, or reach people uh, I, I really dug that, and, and I don't know. I think that that was it. Basically, was one of the most social and most interesting uh, depictions of a mathematician that I had ever seen. Now, let's say a drop of water falls on your hand. Which way is the drop going to roll off? At the very least, it just kind of shattered a mental image that the rest of the world had built up in my head about what what it is that that math people do day in day out. Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Do you think that made you want to study mathematics, or do you think you wanted to study mathematics already, and that just said? It's okay. You can you can be cool. It kind of just uh, eased the way. I think it's more of the latter, if only because I think I had a knack for it. Again, like it was the kind of thing where you know t- t- teachers were like, yeah, you should pursue this. This is this is good. You're you're good at this thing, and uh, and and so I, uh, I I think it definitely opened the doors for that kind of stuff. And I think uh, you know we there, there's a couple of things in the book that I basically talk about how people find their professions often through representations in media. And I think it can just be a, a, a situation where it just kind of knocks down the barrier to entry. Uh, it can give you an opportunity to consider something that maybe just isn't from your, you know, social milieu. Your, your, none of your parents' friends do this job, but you want to do this job because you saw it on ER. Uh, no, none of, uh, you know, you've never seen, a, you know, a woman doctor in your town, but you watch Grey's Anatomy, and so you know that they exist, and so but you can pursue that. And so I think that there's a lot of things that basically representation can do that on some level might inspire people to actually, you know, I want to be an astronaut now, or I want to, you know, serve in the military and fly planes off of boats. At the same time, I think it can also just make it just uh, something more realistic and make it so that it's not just concepts that are doing these things, but but actual flesh and blood people. Before we get back to you, which is what this podcast is about, I want to take issue with your Ian Malcolm thing. Okay, no, hit me, babe. There's no doubting he dresses really cool. Yeah. And and he's got most of the coolest lines in the film. Sure. And he's just he's just a cool dude. I'm not doubting his coolness. That is one big pile of shit. He never appeals to me in that film, despite his job and who he is. And I was trying to figure out why. And I think there are two reasons. One is because he hits on the hero's girlfriend. Yes. Right. Unsuccessfully, I might point out. Absolutely. But takes it with grace. <laughs> Well, I don't know if he takes it with grace. Yeah, maybe, maybe he does. But I don't like that he did it because, you know, Sam Neill's our man. And having and having this having a man in black hitting on his girlfriend kind of maybe already primed me to not love him. Fair. But the other thing is, when the Tyrannosaurus Rex attacks, he's a complete clown. He completely mucks it up. He doesn't he does. get it. You know, Sam Neill knows how to deal with the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And then he mucks it up, gets chased as a result, gets injured and becomes a liability that has to be driven around and nearly gets them eaten by the dinosaur and then he spends the rest of the time injured just like sitting on a table making wisecracks i don't see him as particularly heroic in this film i mean he foretells the exact way that this goes down he, he's the first and only person to actually warn these folks he was clearly given a bunch of money by this organization and when you're given a bunch of money by an organization of course you're just going to try to say the pap that they want you to say but he at least says no i think that what you guys are doing is actually going to cause a serious problem you ought to be more concerned about that and to his credit you know, I think that in any kind of film, you always want to root for the heroes. I think that if a Tyrannosaurus Rex attacked me for the first time, I would probably not know exactly how its vision worked, and I would probably not know exactly what was going on. I think that he was daring and selfless in that moment if, you know, hey, listen, you take a run at a problem for the first time, you don't always get it right, and, and, and you know, maybe in his world there aren't consequences for that. <laughs> Excellent defense. <laughs> I didn't think he was being brave. He was trying to save the kids. You're right. I take it back. Okay, from the heart, all right? From the head, maybe not, but from the heart, he was definitely there. <laughs> I think they'll have that on the tour. Pre Jurassic Park, what were you like as a kid? Well, like, did your love of data manifest itself in other ways? Did you collect baseball cards and look at all the stats, or were you into <laughs> numbers in sport? Were there any, was the writing on the wall? Not really. Again, I, I was kind of like, you know, pushed to play sports that I didn't necessarily have a knack for. I think by the time that I was in high school, I was very into things like debate. I was very into things like mock trial. I kind of liked 
the idea, like, it, you know, I, I had always kind of been keen on expressing myself in that regard. And so I had always been very uh, excited by the idea of, you know, how do you communicate to other people and how do you argue with other people and how do you get your points across? And so I think that, like, you know, while, while I was definitely, like, very fond of of kind of like the fact based elements of that. Like I, when I was always on mock trial, I would always be a lawyer for one team and the expert witness for the other because both of those require that you got to know the numbers and kind of rattle them off. I think it wasn't really until college that I kind of recognized that those skills could be integrated and tied together. That writing and expressing yourself could work actually rather well with, with data and, and uh, learning about your world in that way. Uh, I think you know it was very much. Uh, kind of, you know, I went to I started high school in 2008. Um, I'm sorry, I graduated high school in 2008, and I started and I graduated college in 2012. And over that time, you saw things like Nate Silver's 538 really, you know, start to take off. You saw a lot of just kind of the way the internet started talking about, you know, numbers, math, data, and statistics. Really, you know, from where it was in 2006 when I like was in the middle of high school to where it was when I was just graduating college and starting in journalism, it is it is just night and day. Uh, and so it was, uh, you know, a, a very much a kind of a transitional time of realizing that these were not skills that were in conflict with one another, as I think a lot of people around me had argued, right? Like a lot of a lot of folks will just kind of tell you, well, you got you to kind of pick one. But the ability to kind of express yourself, make arguments and, and kind of be persuasive, and then the ability to kind of do your data analysis, do your math work, and, and kind of making sure that you you have a very excellent foundation upon which to stand when you make this argument. Uh, that, that was a kind of a gradual evolution of, of two things towards one another that uh, took a couple years, yeah. When you started studying mathematics at college at the start, what did you think you were going to end up doing? What was the plan? Did you think you were going to end up being like a research mathematician trying to solve the Riemann hypothesis, or did you always think you were going to be go down this more communication route? What did you think was going to be the path? I, I wish I was so, uh, you know, no, devoted towards towards the larger, more theoretical goals of our field. But no, I grew up in the vicinity of New York City, and I went to a, a, a Catholic boys' school where a lot of people's dads were rich off Wall Street. And I was like, well, worst case scenario, I can just go to Wall Street and, and, and do that. Uh, it is obviously, you know, starting a math math study program in 2009 uh, with with vague ambitions to go to Wall Street is a revelatory moment because you, you that's also when you start seeing things like, you know, math actually kind of goes pretty mainstream after that, uh, when it comes to how we actually talked about how that was working. You saw, I remember I wrote a, like, you know, I wrote a freshman year paper, basically, for this program that I was in, that was talking about the Gaussian Coppola function stuff that we had been seeing folks like Michael Lewis and folks like uh, Felix Salmon report on the front page of, of, you know, at that point, like Time Magazine and stuff. So, so we were seeing different expressions of, of how, Mathematics and how forecasting and how um, the ability to predict or not predict or fail to predict or or hedge or fail to hedge um, had actually had like really serious ramifications in the economy and so I think that that was kind of a uh, an interesting time for me just because you know I'd gone to start this embarking idea on the idea that perhaps. I would go work for Wall Street or a financial institution, and then fairly immediately, you know, several large Wall Street financial institutions begin failing, and and the problem was math at very, at very, at very many times, whether it was understanding it, comprehending it, using it in the right way. Um, but basically, they, they, had, they had built like, you know, actuarial bombs when it came to what they were consolidating within these collateralized debt obligations. And so as I was very much if just interested in that time as a, as a person, because it was, it was a fascinating time to be 19, uh, I was also very, very interested in it somewhat professionally. And I think reading a lot of that journalism around, okay, here's how math actually kind of set the spark for what became the global financial crisis was a really kind of cool way to see like, okay, no, there are people who are doing this. There are people who have a head for this kind of stuff who are able to express it and talk about it in a way. And their job isn't to work for the bank, it's to report about the bank. Were you ever exposed to or seduced by that more esoteric side of mathematics, you know, proof and all the all the beauty of mathematics. Was that yes. something you had much to do with or did you go straight for the No, I loved it. Um I, I it's so I went to, so I went to William and Mary, which is great because William and Mary is a liberal arts uh, college and basically you're encouraged to take a lot of different stuff. And when I was there, even within the math department, I had decided rather early on that I was gonna stay do applied with probability and statistics. But like linear algebra was so cool. It was just an opportunity to kind of see aside uh, like the matrix analysis stuff was just it was mind opening in a way that nothing else had really had been. And so even long after I was like kind of deep it deeper into the um, 
into the applied stuff, I was doing some operations research stuff as well, too, um, which I really, really enjoyed. I kept on really, really enjoying the the theoretical side of it, the proof-based stuff of it. Um, it really, like, the matrix analysis stuff was just, uh, it, it peeled open my brain in a way that I've never been able to really replicate. N- not to say that the, the statistics and probability stuff wasn't challenging, but I think that there is something about, when we're talking eigenvalues and eigenvectors, like, all of a sudden, like, you, you're almost, you are speaking a different language. And so it is, um, it, it was uh, something that I really, really, really loved loved and I got a chance to pursue it and I'm really happy I did. While I was in college, obviously, you know, I, I enjoyed, you know, even back into high school, writing, communicating, and things like that. So I worked for the student newspaper. In part, just it's a good, it's a good counterpoint to the math, right? It's a good um, counterweight, and and it, it gives a different set of skills to kind of work. Uh, in my junior year at college, I took an internship in Washington D.C. and it was for an organization called the Center for Responsive Politics. And the Center for Responsive Politics operates the Open Secrets website, and their main thing is that they inventory every dollar in America that is donated and spent on elections. So you are able to basically track where the money goes in American politics and, you know, draw arguments and conclusions as a result of it. So who's oil and gas funding? Who's the unions funding? All that kind of stuff. Uh, We were able to do some really cool reporting off of that. I think that that was my first kind of, you know, really jumping in and being like, Data journalism is a viable thing. Uh, I can do data as part of journalism. There are people in journalism who are impressed by that, who don't have those skills, who like to work with guys like that. And so that kind of was the spark that was like, I can do this. My senior year of college, uh, I messed around with a few, like, kind of just fun stories. I think my favorite story that I wrote in college and is uh, if there's any people who are in college and, and work for the newspaper and are interested in an excellent data story, um, I Freedom of Information Act requested every parking ticket issued on campus for a year. I then sent a bunch of uh, interns and reporters around to count up every parking space on campus. And then through, you know, simple division, I was able to figure out where the most effective place to park illegally is. And we put that on the front page of the newspaper. It's news that you can use. Kids love it. And uh, kind of from there, I realized that, you know, you can do things with this that you can't do, you know, just through through gumshoe. You you can do things with this that that, you know, I could never, you know, call the the William and Mary Police Department and say, hey, can you tell me where the best place to park illegally is? I have to figure that out on my own. You can break stories that you otherwise can't break. And so uh, when I was applying around, I applied to a place called Business Insider, and I got a job there, internship there. Um, eventually, got hired on in, uh, in that fall uh, as uh, around the politics, uh, the political election at that time. But then after that, you know, we were just kind of like, well, what do we write about now? And it was a lot of just kind of fun things, like, you know, talking about steady state probabilities and and monopoly, right? So what are the most effective places to to try to land on the board? Uh, Highlighting a lot of like data journalism and and map-based coverage um, from that time. And we just found that there was just like, you know, part of it was that BI had a fairly Wall Street audience, but we found that there was, you know, more demand than we had anticipated for smart quant kind of coverage that, you know, maybe, you know, you didn't have to, to go all the way over the top with it, but um, people appreciate it. People, I think, you know, the media has a bit of a trust issue. And I think that if you're coming to bear with data, and if you're coming to bear with evidence, and you're coming to bear with, here's the exact process that I took to get to this conclusion, it, it bridges that trust issue just a little bit. And it makes it a little bit easier for folks to, to, to you know, buy, not only buy into the work that you've done, but also to believe it themselves because they can replicate it, Right. From there, uh, after doing a you know about a year, uh, year and a half uh, with BI doing those kind of fun lifestyle math feature stuff, uh, Nate Silver had just left the New York Times, started up the five thirty eight shingle at ESPN, and I was one of the first hires. And he brought me on to basically do what was then called lifestyle coverage, which was everything that wasn't politics, sports, economics, or or, uh, or science. And uh, and eventually, through, you know, the power of just writing about stuff and, and seeing what the audience enjoyed and seeing what we enjoyed and seeing what we felt like we could contribute to, uh, we came to rename basically culture coverage. And and that kind of dove in on, on movies, televisions, books, uh, all these fun, exciting topics that I think that we spend so much of our lives doing and so much of our, our you know, our you know, hearts go out to this kind of stuff and so much of our world is molded by it. But doesn't really kind of get the uh, the coverage and acclaim that I think a lot of other folks uh, do. Well, did you seek out that niche, that niche of of culture, or did you kind of fall into it because Nate needed that done, and then you sort of had an aptitude for it, or did you were you always like a movies guy and a TV guy, and finally you were getting to do what you loved? I was always a movies guy. I was always a TV guy. I was always again. You got to remember, like I think a lot of data journalism in particular. So like you know. 
with politics, there are polls. And, you know, for the past couple of decades, we've known if you average these polls, you can get some reliable stuff. With sports, sports has always been a sports statistics thing. I remember when I was in college, the, the, what, what was the examples always? It was always baseball statistics. Why? Because there's a very obvious connection between things like home field advantage and things. So it's, it's, it's a great way to kind of show uh, pretty reliable stuff. The, there's uh, tons of data there. Economic data, there's an entire department of the American government in charge of cranking out economic data you have a ton to work with. Culture... Not much. And so there's a little bit of a bar there, right? There's a little bit of a, a, a hurdle that you have to hop over in the sense that you do need to find a way to collect your own data. You need to find your way to basically develop your own thesis and expand on that. And that can be a little intimidating and that can be a little bit difficult and at the very least time consuming. So as a result, there just wasn't a lot of it. You know, there weren't a lot of, you know, pop culture data stuff. And so for me, I mean, I had a blast because it was just such a target-rich environment. It was like such a great opportunity to really get out there and start covering this stuff with a degree of depth and kind of figuring out what this looked like. Uh, and it was uh, it was a real good time. I was there for about five years. Um, I really enjoyed it. I you know got to meet a lot of extremely smart people, and I think the cross pollination there was really phenomenal. Like. I would like you know one of my very good friends from there is is this guy Neil Payne and he uh he's a sports guy and so he you know he and I would just talk all this stuff all the time and one thing that he particularly lent me that was super informative was just like you know he introduced me to things like elo ratings he introduced me to things like maximum likelihood he introduced me to things like how like how people in the sports world evaluate things and and how potentially we can apply that towards other stuff so it was just a a really dynamic environment full of very 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 smart people yeah so that's where i got to culture um i was there for about five years and i'd done their newsletter uh for for most of that the daily morning newsletter and then it came to a point where basically espn was selling them and they were selling to abc and when they went to ABC, they didn't want economics and pop culture anymore. And if they weren't going to do pop culture, then I didn't really want to, I didn't like, I don't want to cover politics. I like, didn't want to do that. Uh, and so I uh, basically was like, I'm going to start my own daily morning newsletter. I think that that's the future of a lot of these things. And they were very, very supportive of it. Uh, they let me promote it within significant digits. And so my newsletter since then has been called Numlock. Uh, it is a daily morning newsletter highlighting fascinating numbers in the news. And uh, I've been doing that for the past like five years now. And I eventually returned to BEI uh, as an editor, uh, where I work on both like our visual and comic-based storytelling um, that... Uh, we, we're very, very proud of that. And as well as uh, I do edit um, some, politi- some political stories. It's nice. Yeah, I, you know, I ran their election for them on 2020. So that was fun. Being a data journalist, do you feel you use very high powered math? Like, do you have to have a degree in mathematics to be a, a data journalist? Do you feel like you're pulling out the big guns or do you feel you're quite low level in that respect? It's a good question. I think it's uh, it's a mile wide, but a couple inches deep. Like, it's, it's very much like you got to know... A lot of stuff, I think you have to be able to speak from a place of confidence on a lot of these things, and having that kind of experience is, is really invaluable. Um, that being said, the barrier to entry on this is lower than folks think. And I, whenever I'm trying to encourage folks, if they want to give it a go, or if they want to experiment with it, or if they're looking for potentially something new, like you can really do some very powerful stuff just through division. And, and, and like you know, you can really do powerful stories that I think even you know, traditional journalists are intimidated by if you go into it with the perspective of let's find some data on this and let's back it up. Um, A lot of it just kind of comes down to process. A lot of it comes down to vetting. Were these numbers developed in the right way? Are they trustworthy? Should uh, should I believe them? Um, But I would say that you're not really cracking at the big guns that often. The thing about journalism that I just very strongly believe is that like journalism exists for the sake of an audience, right? You do it so that it can be read by people and then they can understand their world in a slightly better way. And if you want to accomplish that, you do need to be cognizant of what you're asking of them, right? And so if I'm try if I'm like, you know, I think a good a good line to kind of talk about here is like should you put the regression line in your post, right? And when we were at 538, the answer was often yes, because our audience had either enough statistical aptitude or enough statistical interest that oftentimes it made sense to try to put that in there. If you're p- potentially, like if you're trying to reach a large audience, that'll scare the crap out of somebody. That'll just intimidate them enough that they don't read anymore and then they don't learn what this wonderful data has to do. So you can then just have to think about how you express a regression line, right? You have to say, you know, we found that for every increase in this, there in- tends to be an increase in that. Or, or things of that nature. And so it, it kind of requires you to kind of go back into 
maybe a little bit of math education, kind of, to how best to express ourselves with this. But um, no, to answer your question, you're not really trying to get the big guns, but I am so grateful that I have the depth of experience that I did because it, you know, it helps me understand a big gun when I see it. So You mentioned something a moment ago, and it's something I thought about when I was looking through your book, where you've, you've mined all this information from movies about things char- characters do and across a whole series of films. And the one thing I always marvel at when I look at the research you've done into popular culture is how did you get around the time-consuming yeah. nature of this? Like, do you sit there and watch the films with a notepad and a piece of paper? Do you hire a fleet of students to do it for <laughs> you? How do you mine all this information from hours upon hours upon hours upon hours of movies that have to be watched completely thoroughly to pick up all the details? I mean, first of all, thank you for noticing. Uh, like, I, I'm not going to lie, I put a lot of work on this stuff. Uh, I take this very, very seriously. This project was a couple of years in the making. Um, so sometimes like that, like, you know, some of my favorite projects are just me watching a movie with a clipboard, you know, um, stopwatch, things like that. There are some va- basic tools of the trade that you can do in that regard. There's a lot of stuff in the book that I really love with that. The The section that you're referring to, I think, is there's a lot in chapter one, where basically chapter one's all about how movies affect your body. And so there's a couple really cool things in here. Some of this data is from some academic research that was done by either so, like some, there's some research there from people who study Basically, um, volatile organic compounds, which are the things that living things exhale or excrete that are not oxygen, right? And basically, their argument is that you can actually trace reliably between different screenings of a film spikes in people exhaling different chemicals. And this can be things like everybody flinching at the same time. And as a result, when you flinch, you activate your muscles, a chemical reaction that produces isoprene as a waste product, and so you can see a spike of isoprene every time that you show the same movie in the same cinema, which shows that there's a biological thing beyond simply just sight and sound going on there. There's another one in that chapter that I really, really like that basically measured people's blood before and after watching horror movies compared to other films, and essentially found that the human body prepares itself to be wounded by releasing a coagulation factor over the course of watching a horror movie, in that your brain takes this thing seriously. Your brain takes the threat of, of injury seriously during a horror movie, and that's why you feel it. So that's why it's not just a thing that you see, it's a thing that you feel. That chapter, though, contains some of my favorite stuff, which is um, I built a fleet of galvanic skin devices, um, and basically these are uh, a galvanic skin... Um, so your body at all times has a little bit of sweat on it, um, on your hands. And, uh, and at all, you know, when you feel a little bit of emotional intensity, the, that slight beads of sweat within the pores on your hands increases. I want you to imagine that I'm holding your hands in, the, in, in, a, in a car on Jurassic Park and I'm just dripping water down, right? It's, uh, it's basically on the palms of your hands, uh, you are uh, essentially, you know, having a certain amount or more or less small beads of sweat there. And what we found, what, what, you know, a couple hundred years of research have found, I should say, is that, you know, you can run an electrical current through your hand, a small one, to be clear, but you can run an electrical current through, through your hand with, one, you know, one finger and then have the other end, have the other lead on the other finger. And then you figure out how much of that current makes it to the other side. And then that is actually a proxy for how much resistance electrically your hand has, which in turn will allow us to basically measure how much electrical current is getting through second by second. And what that'll allow us to do is that'll allow us to show, okay, here's the emotionally intense scene of Jaws. We can tell because the the sweat on your hand from a conductivity perspective spiked. And so it's it's one of the things that is used in a lie detector test. The, the, the polygraph test, one of the polygraphs is a GSR. And what it basically is, is like a real-time reading of what's going on in your nervous system. And, you know, not your intentional nervous system. This is really just kind of how you feel and, and how your body's preparing, whether it's fight or flight, whether it's body's preparing emotional intensity. But so basically, this involved me building about nine of these devices. Uh, and then, you know, uh, during the pandemic, I, you know, I loaded up some movies onto Plex and I sent them, I mailed these devices around the country just with my friends. And we're like, please, uh, you know, you here's when you click start, here's when you click stop. And, uh, you know, it, it records it and then just send it on back. So it was the aggregate work of uh, that one must have been about 15, 20 of my friends. Friends, uh, all watching movies for me uh, over the course of you know of a very uh, locked in year. So you know I tried to tried to be valuable with my friends' time and that kind of stuff. And there was stuff I could do and stuff I couldn't do due to time constraints. But I'm very proud of what we got together. <laughs> do you ever hear the complaint or accusation that applying this kind of analysis to art, which is what movies are, yeah, 
remove some of the joy or some of the mystique of the art, having it kind of torn apart, ripped to shreds and turned into numbers and data. Yeah, I uh, I really, I, you know, I myself worry about this complaint all the time whenever I embark on something. And, like, the thing that I always come back to is that, like, damn it, if every time after I've done one of these kind of da- data analysis projects on a piece of art, I come away appreciating it more and understanding a little bit more. And there's nothing that I've ever personally ruined for myself by doing some arithmetic around it, right? Uh, I found that the thing about art and the thing about movies and the thing about television is that they are, these are things that people obsessed over making, right? Like, it, like you know, if you want to talk about, like, you know, Star Wars, like, you know, the, I have a scene where basically I, I, there's a, another thing that I do in the book is, is I use my tracking technology to do some neat stuff to basically evaluate how focused somebody is on, on a film based as kind of a proxy for what the director's doing. And like, if you just imagine like a 10 second frame of Star Wars, do you have any idea how many people spent how many hours drawing those things, building those sets, building those costumes, uh, adding in the computer generated animation? Like, I think that one thing that I'd love people to take away from the book is just understanding how much care and effort goes into making these things, because they really stand up to scrutiny, particularly the classics. And and as a result, like, you know, I, I've, I can't think of a situation in which something or someone or some career that I've covered has been diminished, in my views, after doing the status work on it. I've always come away with a little bit more appreciation, uh, even, even kind of like... Um, what, like taking like you know back at 538 I would do a thing called Hollywood Taxonomy where I would look at an actor's career basically and, and, and plot out you know I would start off with a chart of like just here's their Rotten Tomatoes score against their uh, box office and that would allow us to cluster some stuff and basically writing those out you get a better understanding of who these folks are you know warts and all and, and I think that you can understand like but I, I think that you know just taking a little bit of a deeper look at them it doesn't really undermine the world around it. It kind of gives you a better understanding of it and it gives you a better appreciation for it. So I don't know. I, I, I have worried about that to a hundred percent. Cause I, I have seen what, you know, saber metrics and money ball can do to baseball and how, you know, two decades on, they suddenly had to start changing the rules in order to accommodate what had become a slightly more boring game as a result of people, you know, breaking these, these down. Uh, I've seen how, what it can do to politics and how it can make it, you know, very horse racy versus, you know, actually discussing the issues and stuff. But what I've, you know, what I've really found is that I don't ever really think less of a thing after I've tried to add, understand a little bit more, uh, which I think, if anything, is just a credit to the to the uh, you know craftsmanship that went into making these things. And you got to remember, like you know, movies are the, movies and television shows are the projects of, of hundreds of people, sometimes thousands of people, all working on the same thing, and the quality is going to be there if you kind of keep on rubbing away at it. We see in your book, you do a really interesting uh, analysis of Steven Spielberg films. Yeah, uh, you know, the plot showing graphing like the plot of the film against the way the tension builds and ebbs and that and you show if i read correctly that there is sort of a a theme a pattern a template of sorts to why his films are so good why he's such a great filmmaker and you talk also about the eye tracking and able to see where people are looking in the film and there's so much money in hollywood and it's such big business yeah have you heard or seen much about them using these techniques that you use in the book in the making of their films like are they are they using this stuff to make sure their films are optimized okay so this is like i have thought about this because I, I think that like if they're not they will be at some point the, again here's the thing about hollywood hollywood loves data like hollywood lousy for data they they hmm. test screenings they have uh you know uh, i live in uh, a neighborhood in queens that i think is just uh, like has a very desirable um set of you know people who would see survey who would do survey things were a young vibrant neighborhood and um so you get test screenings all the time here and you just fill out a survey after and then that's how they're able to kind of figure out what their cinema score is. And here's where they're going to figure out how they're going to advertise it. Even going back to the earliest days of Hollywood, like you got to remember that some of the first thing that Gallup was polling when Gallup became a pollster was movie stars. Um, the I remember there's a story from way back when that they would basically, the fan mail was a data point that they used. And so depending on how much fan mail a studio got over an actress or an actor, that informed, okay, hey, maybe we should maybe we should give this one a push. Maybe maybe all of a sudden she's not just supporting anymore. Maybe she can carry a movie on her own because she's getting a lot of letters from Topeka. And so as a result, it, you know, data has always been heavily integrated into the history of Hollywood. And it's 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 like a bit naive to assume otherwise, because I think that now it's like so heavily data infused and you see companies like Netflix 
make pretty compelling arguments that they're a data company first and then and then you know movies kind of second sometimes but i think that like realistically data has always been incorporated into this there's always been testing there's always been market testing they this is a billion multi-billion dollar industry for a reason they don't mess around with it and I think that they do have some cool tech that I actually would have liked to get it my hands on, but I think that, you know, it's expensive to do this kind of market research. You know, typically they'll have, like, there's a button that, like, you hold it positive if you're enjoying the film and negative if you're not having a good time. And that can let them kind of know when the film drags a bit. I think um, the eye tracking technology is rad. Um, again, I, you know, obviously, you know, what's in the book is is a fraction of, of the messing around that I did with it. But, like, as a person who really likes comics, it was fascinating because... I could record my friend reading a comic book and understand here's where they're actually putting their eyes the whole time. Here's what the person who drew the comic book did particularly well. Here's where here's where it could use some improvement. And I think that like in that kind of field, that could be a really interesting technology. Again, only as a growth tool, because I think that at a certain point, you, like you don't need to market test comics that much in order to kind of get a viable product out there. It, it wouldn't shock me if this would be a really kind of fun thing to apply in schools as like, okay, you know, if you want feedback as how you did as a director on this, we did a test screening with folks wearing eye tracking goggles. And so, you know, the reason I bring eye tracking goggles into the book is that there was this very cool study that was all about basically how, you know, people, they, they showed people a bunch of, you know, commercials with eye tracking goggles on and asked them a little while later, which commercials did you like, which ones were the most memorable. And the ones that were the most memorable and most liked were the ones where everybody was looking in the same part of the screen at the same time for the most amount of time. The idea is how effective was a director at herding eyeballs up and down and around the screen? Not necessarily just in dead center, but like how effective was the person at making you look where he wanted or she wanted you to look? And that's direction. That's that's how you direct eyeballs. Spielberg's a master of that. The, so many of the folks that we you know, hold up as the greatest directors of all time are just really good at keeping your eyes where they want them to be. What I what I think could be very kind of fun is like, you know, feedback when it comes to art can always be fundamentally subjective. But like, if you were to show a film student like, hey, listen, here's where you lost everybody's eyeballs. Here's where they, here's the shot that maybe didn't work as much. Here's where you can do different next time. Or again, like sometimes you want to have it kind of be a diffuse thing. So it, I think it would just kind of allow people potentially more insight into whether or not their art is accomplishing what they want it to do. But yeah, I don't foresee in a day in which we are hooking up eye tracking goggles to robots and, and then also a GSR device to basically figure out if this movie's good. I think that that's a reckless way to make art, but I think that it can be, it, it's got its uses, I'll tell you that much. But I can just imagine a film studio saying to the director, look, we've watched your film and we've compared it with Walt Hickey's Steven Spielberg graph. And you're not following the graph. You're, you know, no. you're, you, you need to. You need to something dramatic to happen at the 34 minute mark, or we're not green lighting this film. No, no, please. Uh, I, I think that again, like you know, I don't really come out with anything too prescriptive as here. I think, like, I'll give you a few examples because there's no ro- there's no like perfect way to make a movie, and like there's a Jaws chart in there, and I love Jaws because Jaws it, like does things with tension that like I've never seen another movie do. And if you looked at that chart, you realize, well, it's because about every five or ten minutes, there's a staccato moment of terror, and then it's very chill in between. And so it's basically just the first half of the movie is like, you know, basically a slasher film. And then you have the middle point at the 4th of July where the, where the tension gets higher than anything that you've ever had before. And then after that, it's three guys on a boat and occasional flashes of terror. And, you know, then towards the end, you know, you do get like, you know, it's a pretty sustained action sequence to close it out. But then compare that to Mad Max Fury Road, which is also in there. And Mad Max Fury Road is fascinating just because, you know, it's it's intense and interesting and visually compelling for the first hour and 10 minutes. And then for the last half, it just kicks it up and it is just up and up the whole time. And it it basically it's using tension in a different way. There's another uh, I think there's two more in there that they're they're not all Spielbergs, but one of two of them are Casablanca and the Spike Lee film uh, Do the Right Thing. And those films look very, very similar as their charts. And they're not films that you would necessarily think have a ton in common. Again, one is, you know, one of the greatest romances that we've ever had. One is, you know, obviously, you know, a story about a neighborhood that's slowly boiling over. But nevertheless, they have very similar structures in that the tension just builds and builds and builds and builds. And you can see it over the course of the film. And whether or not you are getting more worried personally your body is and your body's realizing the vibes are getting off the things are getting off kilter things are changing very quickly now and people are going to make decisions that will affect the rest of their lives and the stakes just get higher and higher 
And so, you know, there's lots of different ways to make these kinds of movies. And I think that, you know, I really try not to be perspectivist when it comes to this one's better or this one's worse. I think, you know, we we just ought to learn from the masters while we can, you know? You've written a book. Yes. (laughs) You are what you watch. You've mentioned it a couple of times. (laughs) Once or twice. (laughs) Did you apply any of your skills... To the book, to the draft of the book. Did you send copies to your friends and eye tracker and with the layout of the book and the structure of your chapters? Have you used the things you've learned in your analysis to make your book more compelling? That's a really good question. I think so. Like, so again, like I very much like I've sent it around to a few people that I trust. Uh, I sent it around to a few people that I like know have a couple different backgrounds when it comes to math because I want to make sure that it's hitting. Like, I really want to make sure that the folks who are like me who just love numbers, can't get enough of them, are happy. I Like, there's, I'm releasing as much of the data as I feasibly can, you know, when the book is out, uh, so that people can remix and use it on their own, and potentially if they think it, it's got uses for, you know, education, like, by all means. Uh, so, I, like, there's a thoroughness and a depth there that I wanted to make sure that, so when I reached out to a few friends to be like, hey, can you just kind of vet this for this, there was, there was positive there, as well as just folks who are, are completely new to it. And, you know, maybe just like movies and, and don't necessarily enjoy the the, 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 the actual nitty gritty of the number stuff as much. Uh, and so I definitely did a lot of serving. I would say that if there's a thing that I took away from it, it wasn't necessarily like a technique. It was a like a moral that I read at one point, um, which was, you know, there was this idea at Pixar that because if you write a book about creative people doing creative things, you, you inherently are going to like take some notes. Right. And so there was this idea at Pixar that like a movie is never done. A movie just needs to be released. And I think particularly with data journalism, that is often like the 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 thing that that is slowing you down is is sometimes just not the work itself, but just like, is this done? Like can I not do I not have another couple of weeks to add more stuff to it? Do I not have another chance to go even deeper on it? Like at a certain point you have to call you have to call it. You have to say, I'm content and I think that I've gotten as much as I need to get in here, even though there's more out there, because there's always more out there, and you can always get more depth, and you always can get more variables, and you can always get more, you know, comparison points, and you can always get more. Uh, there's a point where you have to say, like, you know, this is never going to be done, it just has to be released. And I think that that is uh, a very healthy mentality to have about creative work that you're doing, and I think also about data work that you're doing. Just because, again, there's a reason that that, that we call them rabbit holes, right? It's because you never know how deep they go. And at a certain point down the rabbit hole, you just need to you need to write it up and post it. And then, you know, you, you're okay. Always, you can always write a second story and go a little bit deeper than that. But I think that that mentality, I think, has done wonders just for my career in general, just because it has made the ability to get out work that obviously, you know, comparing it to the platonic ideal of the book that you have in your head is, uh, is, is, is you know, shorter potentially. But uh, I think is just as effective and, and, and honestly just a, a better way to communicate things at times than it is to uh, than otherwise, yeah. That said then, if, if you were given more time, is there something else you would have done? Or do you have like a fantasy analysis you'd love to do, but it's just not feasible because of the amount of Ooh. data that would need to be mined or would need to be run? If you got a, have you got a dream? I, so I got to the, so uh, I'll throw both out there. The one thing that I would have liked to do is again, uh, I did a lot of the reporting for this during the pandemic. And luckily our craft is one that you can succeed doing it during the time of lockdowns. That said, I would have liked to travel to, I think there were two or three things that I wanted to kind of see. But I'm, I'm content with the book where it is. I think it's got enough IRL stuff to, to get by. Don't worry about that. I also got to interview so many people because uh, it was very easy to hop on a Zoom. So I, I just interviewed a ton of people and, and got a chance to talk to so many cool people about stuff. Here's the fantasy analysis. People can take this. If you do it, tag me at Waltiki. I will want to read this. And I'll put it in my newsletter. I swear to God, because this is this is this was a bit of a white whale for me. And I, I had to cut bait on it because we had a deadline coming up. So like I have had a conversation with a few friends that, you know, one thing that, uh, there's a chapter in the book about pop culture and geopolitics, right? How countries like the United Kingdom, how countries like Japan, how countries like Korea have really been able to expand their soft power, reach larger groups of people, win people over to their sides, their causes, and their alliances, not through military strength, but rather through their pop culture, by making people like their pop culture and by making, um, you know, by exporting their pop culture in the form of their actors, their actresses, their their plots, their stories, their um, their daytime soaps, their comedy shows and their movies. They've been able to inure a lot of the world to their point of view and their values by doing so. You know, you can see classic examples of this from the UK and folks like James Bond, things like Monty Python, just, you know, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, every now and again, I think it's something like anywhere from 10 
twenty percent of people who win the Academy Award in a given year are British. Like there's 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 a solid export industry going on there that has really successfully won over a lot of the world. Uh, Japan has been cashing a check that was written in the '90s with anime and Pokemon today. Like Japan is is at the highest of its cultural esteem. It, it is it is one of the coolest countries on earth in, in the American perception, in no small part because people grew up playing Pokemon, playing the different Nintendo games, and, and watching Toonami. And then Korea, very recently, we've seen them really see the playbook of those two countries and very specifically from a state-sanctioned perspective, try to imitate it. Um, specifically through, you know, you even have Academy Award winning films like Parasite, you've got phenomenons like Squid Game, you've got obviously BTS, which is a juggernaut in and of its own right, but the Korean wave is is, is absolutely designed and kind of specifically encouraged by the, by the government to do that. There's a country that I wanted to write about that I could not get enough good data fast enough to get it done, and that is Canada, because Canada is very interesting, because Canada is also extremely influential in the United States film industry. There are plenty of shows that, you know, if you look a little bit closer, you realize, wait, actually, this is almost an entirely Canadian cast, but it's an American production, it's an American television network, and basically Canada is just so sufficiently integrated with the American film industry, not only as a shooting location in places like Toronto, but also, like, in just actor exports, folks like Ryan Reynolds, right? Folks like you know, um, the entire cast of many CW shows. Um, like, like you just, you see these folks all over the place. And one thing I wanted to do was I wanted to figure out which American production is secretly the most Canadian. Like, you know, it could be an X-Men movie. It could be any of these different things where basically it is just, uh, you know, a lot of people who live in Hollywood, act in Hollywood, are very famous in Hollywood, but, but, but come from the great North. Uh, I, I wanted to figure that out and I unfortunately could not get it done in time. But I, I think it's it's a very, very interesting question. I have a few ideas. One of them that kind of comes to mind is, is a show like Battlestar Galactica, which is one of those sneaky ones that were, again, made pretty much entirely in Canada, entirely Canadian cast for the most part, with a few exceptions. But um, I, uh, I, I'm i eager to find the answer to that and, and would greatly... Greatly appreciate anyone uh, wanting to advance my, my, my Canadian studies. <laughs> you are what you watch. Available in stores. <laughs> Available in stores. There'll be links in all the usual places so people can check it out. I don't know if you'll take this as a compliment or not, but I think from looking at it, it would be a really cool bathroom book. Yeah. Like, you know, those books that you just skim for five minutes when you're oh, having yeah. a rest break? It's really good for that because you can just open it anywhere and there'll be some graph or plot or clever sneaky thing that you've done that you can just absorb for like a minute or two and then go on with your day i think it's a really good book for that i have i have okay because like you know you write a book and then the number of people that you that, that actually read it before you send it off is probably like you know you can count on one or two hands i got i've been getting like a lot of fun reactions from folks just to have got a chance to get the early one and like there was one guy who was like oh i read it in the course of like two days and like i just blew through it and i want to like reread it and go back to all the stuff there's folks who have been like i have been kind of looking chart to chart i've been going section to section i think it's like i, I tried to write it in a way that you know you can really enter it at any point that you want to. You can use it as a reference. You can use it as uh, something to settle a bar bet. You can use it um, to, to just kind of, you know, read this like kind of long persuasive argument about how pop culture affects people. Again, I got a chance to work with Heather Jones. She's a really phenomenal uh, data visualization professional. And she, uh, sh- she and I worked very, very closely to get all this kind of data into a very, very visual format. Uh, so I, uh, I'm very, very proud of how it came out. I'm very, like, it, it's, it's really fun. And, uh, I think folks are going to dig it. I think that folks are going to like it. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a good read. I have to ask you one last thing. Cause I, I wonder this sometimes when I'm looking through it. Sure. Were you ever like kind of to use a, like a British expression? I sometimes wonder if with a few of the things you do, you're kind of taking the piss a little bit. Oh yeah. Having a bit of a joke. Like I like you, you apply this really mathematical or graphic thing to like a battle from a film where you'll plot yeah. it as a map or there'll, there'll be these things in these films and you're like applying this analysis to it. And I think, is he having a laugh here? Is he having a giggle just thinking how far can I take this shtick? Yeah. I would, again, like, I think that it's like, I love using the tools that we have from various different parts of our world in math and, and, and our skills in that and applying them to a, 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 a you know, their logical conclusion. Uh, I think like two things kind of come to mind from this one is like, you know, I basically looked at what are the motivations of Scooby-Doo villains and what's going on in that world. That That's like an example of like, yeah, like is that, has that chart ever been made before? No, I don't think it has. Um, but the one that I think like definitely typifies what you're asking is like, I have this, this two page spread that is, uh, is Ash Ketchum a good Pokemon trainer? And basically I, I ran, 
God, four billion simulations of Pokemon battles to figure out what the probability is that Ash would win with the team that he had going into a Pokemon battle. And then comparing that with the eventual outcome to basically figure out, uh, like, wins above replacement for Ash Ketchum. So, um, like, I would agree with you. Like, is that taking the piss? Yeah, it's taking a little bit of the piss. But, uh, I, you know, I think if we have these tools, we may as well have as much fun and interesting times with them as we can. Thanks for your time, man. Like I said, there'll be links for people to go and look at all your stuff in the, in the description. I hope, I hope some people read the book. And check out your newsletter. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, the book is You Are What You Watch. The newsletter is Nublock and Brady. Hey, man, thanks for having me on. I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of yours. You know, I'm a big fan of what y'all do. Well, that's all for today. Check out the show notes for all those links as promised to find out what Walt's up to. Buy his book, maybe. I'll also link to our show supporters and a few number file videos I think you might like. And if you enjoy these podcasts, please consider supporting us on Patreon. It really helps. I'm Brady Harron, and you've been listening to the Number File Podcast. What's your favorite movie? My favorite movie? Oh, man. I mean, ask me again tomorrow in the next day. I'll tell you something different. Um, I would say my favorite movie. Uh, I always come back to Empire Strikes Back. Uh, that is that is my favorite. That is one of my favorite movies. I like, um, I think Millennium Actress is one of my favorite movies. Uh, I really, really love that one. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, man. Favorite movie. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I have a lot of favorite directors. My favorite movie genuinely changes time and time again. It is really uh, again i'm very omnivorous when it comes to what i like and i just can't get enough of just kind of you know something new 2001 a space odyssey that really is good um yeah i don't know it's uh it's it's so like i, I don't know I, there's a lot of stuff that i rewatch constantly there's a lot of stuff that i'll put down for years and then come back to um but if i had to recommend a movie to people um watch millennium actress that's a movie that i think is probably the 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 movie that is one of my favorites that is probably the least watched of, the, of those favorites. Uh, people should get a whirl. Satoshi Kon, Japanese film. Um, it is amazing.